short history of Gothic. Plighty by Eudora Welty. It was late afternoon, with heavy silver clouds which looked bigger and wider than cotton fields, and presently it began to rain. Big round drops fell, still in the sunlight, on the hot tin sheds, and stained the white false fronts of the row of stores in the little town of Fars Gin. A hen and her string of yellow chickens ran in great alarm across the road. The dust turned river brown, and the birds flew down into it immediately. "'sitting out little pockets in which to take baths. "'The few people standing with long shadows on the level road "'moved over into the post office. "'After everyone else had gone under cover, "'Miss Clyde Farr stood still in the road, "'peering ahead in her near-sighted way, "'and as wet as the little birds. She usually came out of the big old house about this time in the afternoon and hurried through the town. It used to be that she ran about on some pretext or other, but now Clyde came for nothing. She came every day, and no one spoke to her any more. She would be in such a hurry and couldn't see who it was. And every Saturday they expected her to be run over, the way she darted out into the road with all the horses and trucks. It might be simply that Miss Clyde's wits were all leaving her, said the lady standing in the door to feel the cool, the way her sisters had left her, and she would just wait there to be told to go home. She would have to wring out everything she had on, the waist and the jumper skirt and the long black stockings. On her head was one of the straw hats from the furnishing store, with an old black satin ribbon pinned to it to make it a better hat and tied under the chin. Now, under the force of the rain, while the ladies watched, the hat slowly began to sag down on each side until it looked even more absurd and done for, like an old bonnet on a horse. In a little while there was a clap of thunder. Miss Clyde, go in out of the rain, Miss Clyde, someone called. The old maid did not look around, but clenched her hands and drew them up under her armpits, and sticking out her elbows like hen wings, she ran out of the street, her poor hat creaking and beating about her ears. "'Well, there goes Miss Clyde,' the lady said, and one of them had a premonition about her. Through the rushing water in the sunken path under the four wet black cedars, which smelled bitter as smoke, she ran to the house. "'Where the devil have you been?' called the older sister Octavia from an upper window. Clyde looked up in time to see the curtain fall back. She went inside into the hall and waited, shivering. It was very dark and bare. The only light was falling on the white sheet which covered the solitary piece of furniture, an organ. The red curtains over the parlor door, held back by ivory hands, were still as tree trunks in the airless house. Every window was closed, and every shade was down, though behind them the rain could still be heard. Clyde took a match and advanced to the stair post, where the bronze cast of Hermes was holding up a gas fixture, and at once above this, lighted up but quiet still. Like one of the unmovable relics of the house, Octavia stood waiting on the stairs. She stood solidly before the white and lemon-colored glass of the window on the landing, and her wrinkled, unresting fingers took hold of the diamond cornucopia she always wore in the bosom of her long black dress. It was an unwithered grand gesture of hers, fondling the cornucopia. "'It is not enough that we are waiting here, hungry.' Octavia was saying, while Clyde waited below, but you must sneak away and not answer when I call you. Go off and wander about the streets. Common, common. Never mind, sister, Clyde managed to say. But you always return. Of course. 
Gerald is awake now, and so is your papa," said Octavia, in the same vindictive voice, a loud voice, for she was usually calling. Clyde went to the kitchen and lighted the kindling in the wood stove. As if she were freezing cold in June, she stood before its open door, and soon a look of interest and pleasure lighted her face, which had in the last years grown weather-beaten in spite of the straw hat. Now some dream was resumed. In the street, she had been thinking about the face of a child she had just seen. The child, playing with another of the same age, chasing it with a toy pistol, had looked at her with such an open, serene, trusting expression as she passed by. With this small, peaceful face still in her mind, rosy like these flames, Clyde had forgotten herself, and had been obliged to stand where she was in the middle of the road. But the rain had come down, and someone had shouted at her. And she had not been able to reach the end of her meditations. It had been a long time now since Clyde had first begun to watch faces, and to think about them. Any one could have told you that there were not more than a hundred and fifty people in Fars Gin, counting Negroes. Yet the number of faces seemed to Clyde almost infinite. She knew now to look slowly and carefully at a face. She was convinced that it was impossible to see it all at once. The first thing she discovered about a face was always that she had never seen it before. When she began to look at people's actual countenances, there was no more familiarity in the world for her. The most profound, the most moving sight in the whole world must be a face. The mysterious smile of the old man who sold peanuts by the church gate returned to her. His face seemed for a moment to rest upon the iron door of the stove, set into the lion's mane. Other people said Mr. Tom Bates's boy, as he called himself, stared away with a face as clean blank as a watermelon seed. But to Clyde, who observed grains of sand in his eyes and in his old yellow lashes, he might have come out of a desert, like an Egyptian. But while she was thinking of Mr. Tom Bates's boy, there was a terrible gust of wind which struck her back, and she turned around. Shade billowed and plunged. The kitchen window was wide open. She had done it herself. She closed it gently. Octavia, who never came all the way downstairs for any reason, would never have forgiven her for an open window if she knew. Rain and sun signified ruin in Octavia's mind. Going over the whole house, Clyde made sure that everything was safe. It was not that ruin in itself could distress Octavia, ruin or encroachment, even upon priceless treasures, and even in poverty, held no terror for her. It was simply some form of prying from without, and this. She would not forgive. All of that was to be seen in her face. Clyde cooked the three meals on the stove, for they all ate different things, and set the three trays. She had to carry them in proper order up the stairs. She frowned in concentration, for it was hard to keep all the dishes straight to make them come out right in the end, as old Lethe could have done. They had had to give up the cook long ago, when their father suffered the first stroke. Their father had been fond of old Lethe; she had been his nurse in childhood, and she had come back out of the country to see him when she heard he was dying. Old Lethe had come and knocked at the back door, and as usual, at the first disturbance, front or back, Octavia had peered down from behind the curtain and cried. Go away, go away! What the devil have you come here for? And although old Lethe and their father had both pleaded that they might be allowed to see each other, Octavia had shouted as she always did, and sent the intruder away. Clyde had stood as usual, speechless in the kitchen, until finally she had repeated after her sister, Lethe, 
go away. But their father had not died. He was instead paralyzed, blind, and able only to call out in unintelligible sounds and to swallow liquids. Lethe still would come to the back door now and then, but they never let her in. And the old man no longer heard or knew enough to beg to see her. There was only one caller admitted to his room. Once a week, the barber came by appointment to shave him. Clyde went up to her father's room first and set the tray down on a little marble table they kept by his bed. I want to feed Papa, said Octavia, taking the bowl from her hands. You fed him last time, said Clyde. Relinquishing the bowl, she looked down at the pointed face on the pillow. Tomorrow was the barber's day, and the sharp black points at their longest stuck out like needles all over the wasted cheeks. It was impossible to know what he felt. He looked as though he were really far away, neglected, free. Octavia began to feed him. Without taking her eyes from her father's face, Clyde suddenly began to speak in rapid, bitter words to her sister, the wildest words that came to her head. But soon she began to cry and gasp, like a small child who had been pushed by the big boys into the water. That is enough, said Octavia. But Clyde could not take her eyes from her father's unshaven face. And his still open mouth. And I'll feed him tomorrow if I want to, said Octavia. She stood up. The thick hair, growing back after an illness and dyed almost purple, fell over her forehead. Have you forgotten, Gerald? she said. And I am hungry too. Clyde went back to the kitchen and brought her sister's supper. Then she brought her brother's. Gerald's room was dark, and she had to push through the usual barricade. The smell of whiskey was everywhere. It's night, said Clyde presently. Gerald lay on his bed, looking at her. In the bad light, he resembled his father. He stared at her in an exhausted, serious way. She stooped and held him up. He drank the coffee while she bent over him with her eyes closed. Resting. Presently, he pushed her away and fell back on the bed and began to describe how nice it was when he had a little house of his own down the street, all new, with all conveniences, gas stove, electric lights, when he was married to Rosemary. Rosemary. She had given up a job in the next town just to marry him. How had it happened that she had left him so soon? It meant nothing that he had threatened time and again to shoot her. She had not understood. He had only wanted to play with her. In a way, he had wanted to show her that he loved her above life and death. Go to hell, Gerald said. His head was under the pillow. She took up the tray and left Gerald with his face hidden. It was not necessary for her to look at any of their faces. It was their faces which came between. Hurrying, she went down to the kitchen and began to eat her own supper. Their faces came between her face and another. It was their faces which had come pushing in between long ago to hide some face that had looked back at her. And now it was hard to remember the way it looked, or the time when she had first seen it. It must have been when she was young. Yes, in a sort of arbor. Hadn't she left, leaned forward? And that vision of a face, which was a little like all the other faces, the trusting childs, the innocent old travelers, even the greedy barbers and lethys and the wandering peddlers who one by one knocked and went unanswered at the door, and yet different, yet far more. This face had been very close to hers, 
almost familiar, almost accessible. And then the face of Octavia was thrust between, and at other times the apoplectic face of her father, the face of her brother Gerald, and the face of her brother Henry with the bullet hole through the forehead. It was purely for a resemblance to a vision that she examined the secret, mysterious, unrepeated faces she met in the street of Far's Gin. But there was always an interruption. If anyone spoke to her, she fled. She was becoming more frightened all the time, too. People could tell because she never dressed up any more. For years, every once in a while, she would come out in what was called an outfit, all in hunter's green, a hat that came down over her face like a bucket, a green silk dress, even green shoes with pointed toes. She would wear the outfit all one day, if it was a pretty day, and then next morning she would be back in the faded jumper with her old hat tied under the chin, as if the outfit had been a dream. It had been a long time now since Clyde had dressed up so that you could see her coming. Once in a while, when a neighbor, trying to be kind or only being curious, would ask her opinion about anything, such as a pattern of crochet, she would not run away, but giving a thin, trapped smile, she would say in a childish voice, It's nice. But, the ladies always added, Nothing that came anywhere close to the Farr's house was nice for long. It's nice, said Clyde, when the old lady next door showed her the new rosebush she had planted, all in bloom. But before an hour was gone, she came running out of the house screaming, My sister Octavia says you take that rosebush up. My sister Octavia says you take that rosebush up and move it away from our fence. If you don't, I'll kill you. You take it away. And she would run back to the vegetable patch and begin to curse. The cursing was new, and she cursed softly, like a singer going over a song for the first time. But it was something she could not stop. Words which at first horrified Clyde poured in a full light stream from her throat, which soon, nevertheless, felt strangely relaxed and rested. She cursed all alone in the peace of the vegetable garden. Sometimes, in the middle of her words, Glidy glanced up to where Octavia, at her window, looked down at her. When she let the curtain drop at last, Glidy would be left there, speechless. Finally, in a gentleness compounded of fright and exhaustion and love, an overwhelming love, she would wander through the gate and out through the town, gradually beginning to move faster until her long legs gathered a ridiculous rushing speed. She always ate rapidly, too, all alone in the kitchen, as she was eating now. She bit the meat savagely from the heavy silver fork and gnawed the little chicken bone until it was naked and clean. The next morning, Clyde bit into smiling lips as she cooked breakfast. Far out, past the secretly opened window, a freight train was crossing the bridge in the sunlight. Gerald had appeared dressed and wearing his spectacles and announced that he was going to the store today. The old far furnishing store did little business now, and people hardly missed Gerald when he did not come. A little high school girl could wait on anybody who came in. Now Gerald entered the dining room. How are you this morning, Clyde? he asked. Just fine, Gerald. How are you? I'm going to the store. He sat down stiffly, and she laid a place on the table before him. From above, Octavia screamed, Where the devil is my thimble? You stole my thimble, Clyde Fire. You, you carried it away, my little silver thimble. It started said Gerald intensely. How can a man live in a house with women? How can he? He jumped up and tore his napkin exactly in two. He walked out of the dining room without eating the first bite of his breakfast. She heard him going back upstairs into his room. 
My thimble, screamed Octavia. She waited one moment. Crouching eagerly, rather like a little squirrel, Clyde ate part of her breakfast over the stove before going up the stairs. At nine, Mr. Bobo, the barber, knocked at the front door. Without waiting, for they never answered the knock, he let himself in and advanced like a small general down the hall. He went ahead, under the arm of the tiptoed male statue, and up the dark stairway. There they were, lined up at the head of the stairs, and they all looked at him with repulsion. Mr. Bobo was convinced that they were every one mad. Gerald even had already been drinking at nine o'clock in the morning. Mr. Bobo was short and had never been anything but proud of it until he had started coming to this house once a week. But he did not enjoy looking up from below at the soft, long throats, the cold, repelled, high-reliefed faces of those fars. He could only imagine what one of those sisters would do to him if he made one move, <laughs> as if he would. As soon as he arrived upstairs, they all went off and left him. Mr. Bobo stood and waited to be summoned, and wished he had never started coming to this house to shave old Mr. Farr. But he had been so surprised to get a letter in the mail. The letter was on such old yellowed paper that at first he thought it must have been written a thousand years ago and never delivered. It was signed Octavia Farr, and began without even calling him Dear Mr. Bobo. What it said was, Come to this residence at nine o'clock each Friday morning until further notice, where you will shave Mr. James Farr. He thought he would go one time, and each time after that he thought he would never go back, especially when he never knew when they would pay him anything. Of course, it was something to be the only person in Farr's gin allowed inside the house— except for the undertaker, who had gone there when young Henry shot himself, but had never to that day spoken of it. I'll never go back, Mr. Bobo always ended to his customers. Not even if they paid me, I've seen enough. Yet here he was again, waiting before the sick room door. This is the last time, he said. Bye. And he wondered why the old man did not die. Just then, Miss Clyde came out of the room. There she came in her funny sideways walk, and the closer she got to him, the more slowly she moved. N now? asked Mr. Bobo nervously. Clyde looked at his small, doubtful face. What fear ran through his little green eyes? His pitiful, greedy small face, how very mournful it was, like a stray kitten's. What was it that this greedy little thing was so desperately needing? Clyde came up to the barber and stopped. Instead of telling him that he might go in and shave her father, she put out her hand and with breathtaking gentleness touched the side of his face. For an instant afterward, she stood looking at him inquiringly, and he stood like a statue, like the statue of Hermes. Then both of them uttered a despairing cry. Mr. Bobo turned and fled, waving his razor round in a circle, and Clyde, pale as a ghost, stumbled against the railing. The terrible scent of bay rum, of hair tonic, the horrible moist scratch of an invisible beard, the dense, popping green eyes. What had she got hold of with her hand? She could hardly bear it, the thought of that face. From the closed door of the sick room came Octavia's shouting voice, Clyde, Clyde, you haven't brought Papa the rainwater. Where in the devil is the rainwater to shave Papa? Clyde moved obediently down the stairs. Her brother Gerald threw open the door of his room and called after her. What now? This is a madhouse. Someone was running past my room. I heard it. 
Where do you keep your men? Do you have to bring them home? He slammed the door again, and she heard the barricade going up. Clyde went through the lower hall and out the back door. She stood beside the old rain barrel and suddenly felt that this object now was her friend, just in time, and her arms almost circled it with impatient gratitude. The rain barrel was full. It bore a dark, heavy, penetrating fragrance, like ice and flowers and the dew of night. Clyde swayed a little and looked into the slightly moving water. She thought she saw a face there. Of course, it was the face she had been looking for, and from which she had been separated. As if to give a sign, the index finger of a hand lifted to touch the dark cheek. Clyde leaned closer. As she had leaned down to touch the face of the barber, it was a wavering, inscrutable face. The brows were drawn together as if in pain. The eyes were large, intent, almost avid. The nose ugly and and discolored, as if from weeping. The mouth old and closed from any speech. On either side of the head, dark hair hung down in a disreputable and wild fashion. Everything about the face frightened and shocked her, with its signs of waiting, of suffering. For the second time that morning, Clyde recoiled, and as she did so, the other recoiled in the same way. Too late, she recognized the face. She stood there completely sick at heart, as though the poor, half-remembered vision had finally betrayed her. Clyde, Clyde, the water, the water, came Octavia's monumental voice. Clyde did the only thing she could think of to do. She bent her angular body further. And thrust her head into the barrel, under the water, through its glittering surface, into the kind, featureless depth, and held it there. When old Lethe found her, she had fallen forward into the barrel, with her poor, ladylike, black stocking legs upended, and hung apart like a pair of tongs. Barbara Barnes was reading Clytie by Eudora Welty. The story was abridged and produced by Gemma Jenkins. <laughs>